This paper examines the United States Senate's decision in 1986 to televise its own proceedings, uh, a change that had the potential to both open up the Senate to greater democratic scrutiny, as well as to fundamentally alter its internal operations and power centers, making use of the archived papers of then Senate Majority Leader Robert Dole and Minority Leader Robert Byrd, we get a behind the scenes glimpse into this crucial change in the institution of the Senate. Senate broadcasting represented a key departure from the Senate of the past, which was thought of as its own world, even a citadel, uh, importantly removed from the society and insulated from democratic pressures. Mid 20th century senators, for example, made a distinction between the Senate's workhorses who did the real policy work of the institution and its show horses who sought the limelight and who swooped in at the last minute to claim credit. They also valued the close interactions and apprenticeships that took place in Senate committees over the more participatory uh, legislative process on the Senate floor. In all, traditionalists valued slow deliberation over efficiency and action. The old Senate was an insular body, the greatest deliberative body in the world, as they said. But senators feared that the country would not know and would miss out on the educational opportunity that television could afford. In his study of policy change, political scientist John Kingdon argued that change requires the presence of a policy entrepreneur who can seize the opportunities for change that exist and consolidate support in pursuit of a new policy alternative. Intervening at a moment of potential change, the adoption of Senate television itself required a change entrepreneur who would invest the time and energy into clearing the path for change and attending to the details that made this significant institutional reform possible. That somewhat oddly cast entrepreneur was Minority Leader Robert Byrd of West Virginia. Byrd was unexpected as a change entrepreneur in part because his reputation was primarily as an inside player in the Senate, a historian of the institution and a master of arcane legislative process. As Byrd said here, comparing himself to predecessor Mike Mansfield, I never sought out the press. I felt that others were better on television than I was. It was not my forte. Still, the pressures to adopt Senate television were mounting. This was the sunshine era of greater openness in Congress, and the House had successfully adopted, adopted its own televised proceedings in 1979. Moreover, significant generational change was underway, and younger, more media-savvy senators were pushing the institution forward. Finally, Byrd had just gone on, undergone a challenge to his own leadership by Senator Lawton Childs. Although Byrd won that leadership race handily, two to one, in fact, uh, even his supporters highlighted as a deficiency in his leadership, his relative willingness and ability in, in terms of engaging in public leadership using mass media. Byrd introduced Senate Resolution 28, which called for radio and TV broadcast coverage of the Senate, an appropriation in the millions of dollars for facilities and equipment to televise, restrictions on how tapes of Senate proceedings could be used, and importantly, adjustments to existing Senate rules, especially regarding minority participation and obstruction. The resolution called for a test period in which TV's impact on the Senate could be studied. These rules changes central to Byrd's advocacy elicited concern even among advocates of Senate television like Republican Bill Armstrong, himself eager for the Senate to televise, but wary of the rules changes that minority party Democrats sought. Yes, there's three uh, changes that uh, are of particular concern to me, and certainly there are changes needed in the Senate rules, but the three that are of the most concern to me are the following. First, a proposal to require that all amendments after invoking a germaneness requirement would be uh, subject to a ruling of the chair as to whether they were germane. Now, that's something that the Senate has never had in simplest terms. It would rule out even the offering of such amendments as the Graham Rudman Hollings proposal, which came to the floor as a non germane amendment, the criminal code, and uh, many, many others. In fact, much important legislation has originated in the Senate 
as a non-germane amendment to a Senate bill. A second change which has been suggested is uh, to restrict to no more than two hours the right of the Senate to debate the motion to proceed to legislation. It sounds like an arcane or a technical provision, but the right of unlimited debate, even the right of filibuster, is one of the most ingrained traditions of the Senate. And what it does is it protects the right of a minority, of even one senator in some extreme cases, uh, to debate an issue at length, raising the public understanding of it around the country. That doesn't mean and never has meant that one senator can uh, endlessly prevent the Senate from acting. But it does say that a senator ought to have the right to speak, even at very great length, even all day or for... In all, proponents and opponents of Senate television saw the stakes of the change in diametrically opposed ways. Proponents saw it as expanding democracy and providing for public education, whereas opponents saw it as likely to promote grandstanding or greater use of visuals and props that would, in effect, dumb down Senate floor debate. Proponents uh, saw the rules changes as an opportunity to make the Senate more efficient, to minimize delays, and to clear out arcane procedures that slowed the institution. Byrd said this was an opportunity to clean up the Senate's act. Opponents, like Armstrong, saw it as a threat to minority rights and the filibuster. And whereas proponents thought the Senate needed to televise to compete with the White House and to keep pace with the House, which had been made more visible and impactful by C-SPAN, opponents of Senate TV wanted to preserve committee power, Senate decorum, and the comity that made compromise possible. Probably propelling the change was the fact that uh, Byrd, once while back home, had mistakenly been introduced as the now more famous and public Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, who is uh, in this photograph here. For his part, Byrd had always seen the possibility that, as he says, quoted here in this Democratic Policy Committee memo, the Senate can maintain our traditions while also meeting the realities of our time. It was up to Byrd to clear the path, addressing logistical and even aesthetic concerns about how the Senate would appear on TV, securing the cooperation of Bob Dole, who had always been more ambivalent about Senate tele television, and addressing the concerns of opponents, most notably Senator Russell Long, who led the opposition to television in the hopes of preserving the traditional Senate, its committees, and minority rights. And also that the majority leader and I could begin to develop uh, procedures that would accommodate uh, this new medium with respect to Senate uh, debate. I also decided I will leave up to the Rules Committee uh, the development of those pre procedures working in conjunction with the two leaders. Because I don't think we can resolve those procedures here this morning. I don't think we can resolve them without a test period. Uh, nor do I think that any other approach will be satisfactory. I think we all agree that uh, this is an idea whose time has come and maybe has, uh, but, but has not passed. Um, the procedures are going to be difficult, as I have stated all along. A key problem being that of determining how we assure the minority of equal time and fair treatment. This was crucial to Byrd's efforts to shore up his leadership within the Senate Democratic Party. As his staffer, Abby Saffold, wrote in a memo that set forth, set forth Byrd's priorities for 1986. First, Byrd had to hold dull to his commitment to, to hold floor time for S-28, S-Res-28. Uh, and secondly, and most importantly, to be seen by his colleagues as having led this effort. Leadership negotiations between Byrd and Dole are documented in the papers of each, uh, and they led to key changes that included the adoption of gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. An earlier plan had considered whether the majority leader or both the majority and minority leader could decide when the Senate uh, 
would be televised and then when the television cameras would be turned off um they agreed on an interim test period and uh significant rules changes which importantly would be made contingent on the continuance of broadcast coverage that is if at the end of the test period the senate discontinued tv broadcasts uh they would also discontinue the rules changes key to these negotiations was quite expectedly the relative balance of power between the majority and the minority as as saffold wrote a number of doles Dole's rules proposals are almost identical to several that you, Bird, have, have proposed, but a number, number of them seem to go too far in the direction of streamlining Senate procedures at the expense of the minority. The Senate made good, uh, quite good use of its interim test period. Each leader had appointed colleagues to a monitoring committee um, that would report to the Senate uh, Rules and Administration Committee. Uh, they conducted surveys of members and served as sounding boards for their varied experiences with television. And they commissioned the Congressional Research Service to study the impact of proceedings. They were concerned about aesthetic details too, uh, that included the color of the paint on the walls and of the drape behind the presiding officer they wanted to improve the audio quality and they wanted to try to keep staff activities and other distractions out of camera frame when senators were talking. Uh, they certainly wanted to minimize the, those embarrassing moments that had been caught on TV during the test period, which included a staff member who had fallen asleep uh, and those moments when the presiding officer was uh, signing letters or reading the newspaper rather than attending to the Senate's business. There were some obvious impacts, uh, morning business and the unconstrained speaking opportunity for senators of what's called special orders time were increased, uh, as was the number of points of order um, that senators made. Senators uh, were spending less time on the floor as they could monitor, it, monitor its activities from their offices or even in some cases from their homes. Uh, and there was concern uh, about senators grandstanding and playing to the cameras as Senator John Glenn noted here. Mr. President, this is the first day of television in the United States Senate. And I voted for that because I think the people of this country do have a right to know. Well, Mr. President, uh, this includes a lot of things that they, the people of the country deserve to have a right to know about the United States Senate. But I do have some reservations as to whether this will change the way the Senate operates. Now, in recent weeks, we have had a lot of advice here in the Senate. We've had committee meetings about uh, what the camera angles will be and how to best uh, keep your head up and look at those cameras. And we have had meetings about how to hold a mic so you don't make some noise such as that, rubbing against my, my clothing here. And we shouldn't even hold the mic because it is liable to make a noise here. And those of us with thinning hairlines or little hair on the head have been advised that you do not lean over like this into the camera. Because that will give a poor impression. And Mr. President, I will not say that uh, TV in the Senate is going to change anything. But uh, I wish to note that we've had advice on how to do this and uh, how to make certain that we, we cut that shine on the head and if necessary, how to do the eye shadow and the whole thing so that those of us unfortunate enough to have bags under the eyes uh, may look a little bit better. Now, Mr. President, I would hasten to add that personally, of course, I plan to do nothing different. Uh, now, after we have that done, of course, we may even want to uh, perhaps be certain that everything is done properly for the camera here. And uh, we have even had advice that uh, we do not do as I did today and come in with a plain old white shirt and a summer tie. Heaven forbid. Now, I don't know whether my colleagues feel that this would be a better decorum for the Senate. 
And uh, I see the distinguished Senator Stafford over here nodding no. But uh, perhaps the people of Ohio would be glad to make a judgment on what they want to see me attired in here in the United States Senate. So, uh, Mr. President, these are just a few of our concerns here in the Senate, and I'm uh, sure that none of us will do a thing differently in the Senate of the United States now that we are on television. Thank you. Ultimately, the Congressional Research Service determined that the overall impact was minimal, uh, especially as it related to debating and legislating. Floor mending activity did not increase uh, compared to the prior era studied. Uh, closure filings had not changed much, and neither had debate time. As Al Gore, who was on the monitoring committee, wrote to Majority Leader Dole, television coverage has changed the patterns of Senate floor activity very little. Opponents' concerns about change had not materialized, and the Senate uh, made television permanent. The story of Senate TV is, to a significant degree, the story of Robert Byrd's leadership. He consolidated support for this institutional change when it was not preordained that it would happen, and it still faced significant opposition. Um, he negotiated compromises to accommodate the majority party and other competing interests. He cleared the opposition of traditionalists like Senator Russell Wong, who finally agreed not to filibuster um, uh, so long as he uh, could get some individual votes uh, on rules changes. And Byrd tended to the important technical details of both television and of Senate rules to make the Senate's experience successful technically and politically. Uh, its impact was, of course, significant going forward, and I'll leave you with Byrd's own assessment. This is what I'm saying about television coverage in the Senate. The American people, if they're able to view the Senate debates, they will get by virtue of the Senate rules, which allow for lengthier debates, they should, the American people should be able to get a deeper understanding because the issues can be probed more thoroughly and more deeply in the Senate. And for that reason, I think it's, among many reasons, it's so vitally important that the American people know what their Senate is doing and be able to view the deliberations there. Philadelphia. So I will stop there and just thank the conference organizers uh, for a really well put together program. And I look forward to comments and questions. Okay, thank you, Doug. Joining us now is our panel F discussant, Eric Weimer. Eric is a doctoral candidate at the Bryant Lamb School of Communication in Purdue University. He researches political communication, media effects, and the influential relationship between political elites, the news media, and the public. His work has focused on labor strikes in America. Eric plays the drums in a punk band and enjoys binge watching on comedy podcasts. Welcome, Eric Weimer. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the nice introduction. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Uh, my internet loves to kick me out of Zoom meetings, so if that does happen, I really apologize in advance. Hopefully, I'm crossing my fingers that um, it'll hold out for me. But um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks to um, Dr. Harris for that presentation. Um, I have my uh, I love the C-SPAN archives coffee mug with me, so um, I'm in the zone. Um, so I, it was such a pleasure reading this paper, um, and I just really have a few kind of thoughts um, that came up as I was reading. I don't really have any like explicit questions um, or suggestions, more so things to think about as you're kind of finalizing this research. Um, but just in general, um, I really appreciated this paper, I, I always think, I always really like and appreciate um, when scholars take something that maybe is taken for granted and kind of zoom in on it, put a magnifying glass over it and say, how 
how does this actually happen? How did this go down? Um, and, you know, something we might take for granted is the Senate's on TV. Um, well, how did it actually get to that um, place? Turns out <laughs> a lot of argumentation went into it. Um, it was a long fought battle. Um, so I think this paper does a really good um, job of shedding light on that process. Um, overall, as I was reading this paper, I really saw it as an issue of persuasion. Um, it really feels like a story of the various dimensions of persuasion. You have a ton of different differing views on whether or not the Senate should be televised. Um, and you have uh, these persuasion attempts to get the Senate te televised come up against those differing attitudes on whether or not the Senate should be televised. Attitudes are kind of the big construct when it comes to persuasion. Um, and I found it very interesting throughout um, the differing attitudes that different senators in different positions of power and leadership um, had on televising the Senate proceedings. Um, for example, most notably, uh, Bob Dole um, often classified as being really ambivalent to the, um, to the issue what we would call in persuasion a non-attitude maybe. Um, and some people were opposed. Uh, Russell Long was the example brought up, Senator Long, and some were for it. Um, but along the way, those differing attitudes that people have about it require different persuasion strategies. Um, and seeing how, in particular, using Senator Byrd as a lens through which to examine those differing persuasion strategies, depending on who the audience was, I thought was, um, really well done and um, painted a very good picture of what this process was like. So I appreciated that. Um, a few things that came up as I was reading. Um, I was curious to hear more about um, viewership of the House proceedings at the time as these discussions were going on. You mentioned it briefly, um, of course. And of course, this paper is about the Senate. So um, the fact that you focus on the Senate is good. but. It is interesting that there is this pretty direct parallel at the time um, that senators could use to say, look at the House and see um, what those House proceedings being televised was doing for um, the representatives, what it was doing for public perceptions of the House of Representatives. Um, I just kind of was curious to hear the senator's view of the House proceedings being televised and how that informed their attitudes towards their own proceedings being televised. Um, I kind of was curious, um, like, for example, um, were senators just kind of sitting around and guessing at what the Senate, um, televising the Senate proceedings would do? Were they kind of just guessing what it would do for their political careers, what it would do for their public perception of the Senate? Um, or were they explicitly using um, the way that the House was televised, for example, like um, audience numbers, where people really even tuning into these House proceedings? Could you really attribute any uh, differing effects before and after the House were televised to the fact that they were being televised? Um, and were senators kind of using that to fuel their arguments for or against um, televising the Senate proceedings? I would have, I, I was just curious, um, in what specific ways did it seem like they were using the televised House proceedings to make their arguments for the Senate? Um, I was interested in that. I also um, started thinking about, because you bring up the competing forces that go into um, a senator who's elected as some sort of whip. So using Senator Byrd as the example, um, you have pressure from the more rank and file senators. I'm not sure if that's the right phrase to use, um, but you know, the more rank and file senators, you have pressure from them to do what they elected you to do. You also have pressure from your constituents. Um, so from the public, there's, and maybe those two things are competing. Maybe they work in tandem. Um, but I was um, interested in hearing more about that interplay of the pressure that they were getting from other sen fellow senators, from colleagues, but also from the public. Um, and that might just be because I'm unfamiliar with this literature. Um, 
But I was interested in hearing more about that interplay between the internal and external pressure to televise the Senate hearings. Like, for example, were senators at the time hearing from constituents that they wanted to be able to watch the Senate? Um, it seems like there's a heavy mix of senators wanting political power internally among their colleagues and senators wanting political power among the public um, to their constituents. So how much of that was um, fueling their arguments for or against um, C-SPAN 2, what eventually became C-SPAN 2? I was interested to hear more about that, um, the interplay between the internal and the external struggle. Um, so what's the role of the public in all of this, basically? Were they considering that? Were they only considering it for their political gain? Or did they care about the um, you know, democratic uh, benefits, stuff like that? Um, I was interested in hearing more about that. Um, the last note I have, so I don't take up too much of your time, um, kind of a weird note, but I just was curious, and I'm glad that you brought him up in your presentation, but I just was curious if there's more to say about Bill Armstrong um, as a senator, the, being a Republican. Um, it seems like, the way that you characterize it, it seems like his view of the um, of televising the Senate was ultimately what people agreed with, um, and yet Berg still um, kind of claimed it as his own and said, I've been the champion of this um, the whole time, even though his ideas weren't the ones that ultimately convinced uh, senators that televising their proceedings would be a good idea. So I wanted to like, you drop in like a paragraph or two about um, that instance. And I, I found myself wanting to hear more about um, what influence uh, Senator Armstrong had in that process, why it was his, um, idea of the the televising the proceedings that ultimately resonated with more senators if if that's even an accurate characterization um i don't mean to put words in your mouth but yeah i just found myself wanting to hear more about um the fact that someone had ideas for televising the senate that more people agreed with but senator bird ended up taking credit for it um yeah, those were the overall the things that came to mind as I was reading. But like I said at the beginning, I thought uh, it was an incredible paper, genuinely really just fun to read. Um, I always like hearing about how these things come about. So I appreciate you um, taking the lead on analyzing that, figuring it out. And thanks for sharing your research with us.